Well, seeking the Lord's blessing, I would invite you to once again turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 11. Nehemiah chapter 11. We have been studying this book, which is all about reformation and restoration, the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, a picture of those times of Reformation that take place throughout history. Today we come to chapter 11 of Nehemiah, and this is where we learn about how the city of Jerusalem was to be repopulated, how the city was to be repopulated. And so I'd like for us to look at the first six verses of Nehemiah chapter 11. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, And the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. These are the chiefs of the province who lived in Jerusalem. But in the towns of Judah, everyone lived on his property in their towns. Israel, the priests, the Levites, the temple servants, and the descendants of Solomon's servants. And in Jerusalem lived certain sons of Judah and the sons of Benjamin. Of the sons of Judah, Athaiah, the son of Uzziah, son of Zechariah, son of Amariah, son of Shephatiah, the son of Mahalalel, and the son of the sons of Perez, and Maasiah, the son of Baruch, son of Kolhosa, the son of Hazaiah, the son of Aadiah, son of Joyarib, son of Zechariah, son of Shalonite, all the sons of Perez, who lived in Jerusalem, were 468 valiant men. All the sons of Perez who lived in Jerusalem were 468 valiant men. Now, so far as we have studied this book of Nehemiah, we have seen how the walls surrounding Jerusalem had been rebuilt and the gates of the city restored. We have seen the spiritual revival of the people through the reading and the preaching and the prayer that took place in the assembly. And just recently, over the past few weeks, we've seen the covenant that the people made where they rededicated themselves to solemnly walk in faithfulness according to the word of God. But now that the walls of the city have been rebuilt, there is a question that remains. And that is, who is going to live in Jerusalem? Who will live within the walls of this city? Now, as we look at this question, I want us to think together about two main subjects in these first six verses. And they are these two subjects. First, the place where these people are to live. Jerusalem, the place. And then secondly, the people the people who are to live there. Well, let's think about the place, first of all. What is the place that needs to be populated? It is the city of Jerusalem. And it is called Jerusalem three times in this first two verses. If you look at verse 1, Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, And the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is the place. But it seems clear from what we have just read that this city was not a very popular place. In other words, it does not seem as if people want to live in this city. Living within the walls of Jerusalem at this time was not 
a desirable thing to do. It doesn't look as though people were standing in line clamoring to get a place in Jerusalem. And we can see this from the fact that those who volunteered to move to Jerusalem were blessed by those who did not go. If you look at verse 2, and the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you for going to live in Jerusalem. The Lord bless you there. Now, why was it that people didn't want to live in Jerusalem? Why is there a hesitation? Why would the majority of the people want to remain living out in the country or in the country towns? Well, from an earthly point of view, it's understandable. Moving from one's country home into the city of Jerusalem would entail a great adjustment. Not only would it mean giving up the spacious life of living in a country town and exchanging it for the city life, a smaller home, more claustrophobic surroundings. Not only this, but Jerusalem at this time was no Singapore. It was no Dubai. Much of it still lay in ruins. This would have been a very difficult and unappealing move. And so, in many ways, the people looked upon the opportunity of living in Jerusalem with the same kind of eyes with which Lot looked at the green pasture lands of Sodom. The city just doesn't look like a nice place to live. And there really aren't many opportunities to make a good living. I would rather stay out here in the country with my business and enjoy the rest of my life here. It's too great of an adjustment, too great of a sacrifice. It just doesn't appeal to me. So let other people go and live in Jerusalem. And so, just from a purely physical or materialistic point of view, moving into the city was not very appealing to many people. But then there's another reason why moving to Jerusalem did not appeal to so many of the people. And that's because Jerusalem was a holy city. A holy city. Look at verse 1. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city. Jerusalem was the holy city. Why was it the holy city? Because the temple of God, the house of God, was within Jerusalem. That's where it was located. This is the city where God chose to set his name and to have his house built there. This was the place. This was the city where God chose to put his name. This is the one place on earth where the true and living God was to be worshipped. Jerusalem, the holy city, set apart, sanctified. And that meant that those who lived in Jerusalem ought to be a holy people. In other words, there would have been a higher expectation of holiness among the inhabitants of this city. The people who live closest to God's house surely will be expected to live holier lives than those who live out in the country. Surely among the people who claim to be the Lord's people, those who live within the city where God's temple was located ought to walk in holiness of life. You know, there would be lots of Levites and lots of priests living in Jerusalem, and they would be requiring of those in the city to live faithfully according to the law of Moses there would be a higher expectation of holiness among those people living in the holy city. 
And so perhaps many of the people thought to themselves, do I really want to live such a holy life? Do I really want to be required to have a higher standard? As Matthew Matthew Henry says, those who don't care much for living a holy life would not want to live in a holy city. And this may have been part of the reason why some didn't want to move to Jerusalem, because it was a holy city. But you know, there's another reason why people didn't want to live in Jerusalem. And that's because it was a hated city. It was a hated city, hated by the world. Not only was Jerusalem a place where one could not really make the kind of living that one could out in the country, and not only was it a place that would require holiness, Jerusalem was a hated city, a history of persecution. The nations of the world constantly attacked and besieged the city. And you know, when war came to the land of Israel, Jerusalem was the place where the most suffering took place. And so living close to God's house carried with it the greater liability of suffering. Do I want to live in a place that is hated by the world? That often suffers persecution and hardship? This is quite a picture of Jerusalem, isn't it? Here we see the holy city of God, where God's temple is found. And with it we see that there are places to live. And people are invited to come and live within the holy city. And yet, almost no one wants to go. Well, is this not true of the heavenly Jerusalem? Doesn't this show us something of life in this world right now? Jesus has gone to heaven and he has said, I've, I go to prepare a place for you. And the Lord has a city prepared. It's the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the holy Jerusalem. But people don't really want to live there, do they? People would rather stay in the world as it is here and now. They would rather live their lives forever in this world if they could and pursue the pleasures and riches and activities that creation has to offer them rather than to draw near to the Lord and to seek the heavenly, holy Jerusalem. I don't want to be required to live a holy life as I look forward to the holy city of God. People say, I don't want to have to put away every sin. I'm comfortable in my own way of life as it is. I don't care for the heavenly Jerusalem. And why would I want to move my whole life and my whole family closer to God's house if it would result in persecution? I don't want to be persecuted by the world. I don't want to be hated by the world. I'd rather keep my distance from God's city. Can you see how these verses teach us about our present day? There's nothing here that isn't happening today. Being a Christian, being part of the city of the Lord Jesus Christ, is still as unpopular today as it was then. But you know what's ironic about these words that we're studying here in Nehemiah 11? What's ironic is that this lack of enthusiasm for living in Jerusalem was not from the world, but from those who professed to be God's people. Those who professed to be children of Abraham. Those who would say of themselves, I'm like Abraham. I desire a better country. I desire a better country than what can be found in this world. I desire a heavenly one. And like Abraham, I'm looking forward to the city whose designer and builder is God. I'm not like Lot, who chose the earthly city. I'm like Abraham, 
who walked with God in the promised land. You see, these Jews in Nehemiah's day would have sung the same psalms that you and I sing today. They would have sung, for example, Psalm 84. They would have sung this, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. They would have sung, My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. They would have sung Psalm 137, Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I don't remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. These were the songs that they would have been singing, and yet now that there's an opportunity to actually live in Jerusalem, next to the temple, The very people who sing these songs don't really want to go there. Is it any different today? Is it not the case that for many Christians today, the driving motivation for where they live in this world is a material motivation, not a spiritual one, not a concern for the Lord's house, the city of God, Not seeking a faithful church to become a part of. Not considering the long-term implications of where one decides to live. Rather than thinking about these long-term implications, what will moving to this place do to my soul? What will be the implications for my children, for my grandchildren? The motivation is more, how much more money will I make here? How how much of a better house can I live in if I go to this place? Jerusalem, the holy city. This was the place that was to be populated. And you know, it's interesting, in the days of Solomon, when Jerusalem was at its zenith, everyone would have wanted to live there. When it was popular, when it was spectacular, when the world would come and marvel at this city, then everyone would want to live in Jerusalem. But now in Nehemiah's day, it's broken down. It's been put back together with burned bricks and stones. The inside is mostly rubble. It's not appealing. I think there should be encouragement for us in this as we live in the present day in which we live, when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a popular place to be, where it's not a city where people are clamoring to come to, there's encouragement that in a way, in a real way, we are somewhat like the people of Nehemiah's day, who despite the unpopularity and the difficult nature of living in Jerusalem, have chosen to do so. The place, Jerusalem. Well, I want us to move on and look at the second thing here, and that is the people. What kind of people will populate Jerusalem? What kind of people? And again, as we look at this, we can apply it to our present day. Because, you see, this history is a picture of what Jesus Christ is doing right now. Jesus is building his church. And he is bringing a people out of the world to live with him in the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. And these verses show us what the people are like who live in this Jerusalem. Let's just consider four observations about these people. And the first one is this. The first thing we see about this people is that they are a chosen people. They are a chosen people. Look at verse 1. Now the leaders of the people of Israel lived in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city. They cast lots. Who would live in Jerusalem? 
Let's cast lots to find out. Now, this was not just an unbiased way that people were using to decide who would have to go to Jerusalem. You know, much like we draw straws today and who gets the short straw. Oh, I guess I'm going to go. No, this is the people seeking the Lord's decision. This is the people handing the decision over to the Lord. Casting lots was the means by which God often used to declare his will. As Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Casting lots was used to to determine uh, the boundaries of the promised land, the inheritance for all the tribes. That was done by the casting of lots. Casting of lots was used to discover the sin of Achan. The casting of lots was used to determine the service that a Levite or a priest would do within the temple. And perhaps the most famous example of the casting of the lot is the casting of the lot to choose who would take the office of Judas Iscariot. And you remember that. That's recorded in Acts chapter 1 and verse 26. And there we see the early church, as they cast that lot, declaring, Lord, this is your decision. Show us who you choose to fill this position. And so the casting of lots here points to the reality that it's God's sovereign choice as to who is to live in the holy city of Jerusalem. Romans 11.5, so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. 1 Thessalonians 1.4, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. 1 Peter, or excuse me, Revelation 17.4, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, And those with him are called chosen and faithful. You see, those who dwell in the Lord's house, in the holy city of Jerusalem, they are chosen by the Lord, every one of them. And you notice, as Revelation says, it does not say that they are called faithful and chosen. No, they are called chosen and faithful. It's God's first move. He chooses them. And that's the first observation about the people who populate Jerusalem. Now the second observation is this. We see something else about those who populate Jerusalem, and that is they are a willing people. They are a willing people. Look at verse 2. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. Here we see those who go to live in Jerusalem as those wanting and willing to do so. They, of their own will, decide to leave their old life behind and begin a new life in Jerusalem. And this is also true of every Christian. Everyone whom the Lord calls, everyone whom the Lord chooses, who is part of the holy city of God, no one comes to the Lord's city against his will. You see, when the Lord chooses who will live with him, he also gives them a new heart, a new nature. And this enables them to want to come to him freely. They see their need And they have a desire for Jesus Christ. And this reminds us of Psalm 110. The most quoted psalm of the New Testament. In verse 3. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. Well friends, this is the day of the Lord's power. Jesus is ruling. He's building his church. And he's making people willing to come to him. And it's evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in their hearts. That's the second observation. The third observation about those who populate Jerusalem that's taught here is that they are a redeemed people. 
Jerusalem is not populated by the righteous, but by sinners. Look at verses 4. Look at verse 4. And in Jerusalem live certain sons of Judah and the sons of Benjamin. The sons of Judah, Athaiah, the son of Uzziah, the son of Zechariah, the son of Amariah, the son of Shephatiah, the son of Mahaliel, of the sons of Perez. And then verse 6. All the sons of Perez who lived in Jerusalem. What's striking about this? What's striking about the fact that the sons of Perez are going to live in Jerusalem? Well, it's the history of how Perez came to be. Do you remember? Not only was Perez a child born out of wedlock, he was a child born of an incestuous act of sexual immorality. Perez was the result, the consequence of sexual immorality. What hope would one expect for such a child? What expectations would he have? Should he not live forever in shame and disgrace? But what do we find here? We find here that Perez and his descendants are raised up by God's grace to the highest place of honor and brought to live in the holy city of Jerusalem. And they're called valiant men by the Lord. And my friends, never forget this. We all begin in sin. It doesn't matter what form that sin takes we're all by nature born children of wrath, but God redeems. And the holy city of Jerusalem is populated by those who were born dead in trespasses and sins. Now that's a great encouragement, isn't it? Jesus did not come for the righteous, but for sinners. And that's who populates the holy city of Jerusalem. Well, the last observation about these people that populate the holy city of Jerusalem that we see here is they're not only chosen, they're not only willing, they're not only redeemed. What are they? They are valiant. They're valiant. Look at verse 6 again. All the sons of Perez who lived in Jerusalem were 468 valiant men. This is another description of those who populate the holy city. They're valiant. What does that mean? They're warriors. Why is that important? And what's it a reference to? Well, think about it. What was the main reason for having Jerusalem repopulated? Well, the walls had just been completed. It's about four miles of walls. And there weren't enough people to defend those walls. We've seen how the walls of Jerusalem are a picture for us of the boundaries of doctrine and truth that the Scripture teaches, the bulwarks of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not enough just to have walls. You need valiant men to defend those walls, to stand upon those walls, and be prepared to fight for the holy city. Doesn't Jesus tell us to be valiant today? To testify to his name? To not be ashamed of the gospel or any of the truth of his word? To stand for the truth? To speak the truth? To defend the truth? Jude 3, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to you. You see, the church, the holy Jerusalem, and its walls, that is, its, its doctrine, its boundaries, they don't stand alone. They require people to stand on those walls and defend them. And that's what we see here. 
the valiant, redeemed men of Perez coming in to dwell in Jerusalem. Well, may the Lord bless this brief meditation on his word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks to you for your city. And, O oh Lord, we confess with our tongue as we believe in our heart that it is this heavenly Jerusalem that we seek. And we pray that you would continue to stir this desire within us and that we would properly look at the things of this present life as secondary in light of that great and glorious city. And that even now, as we live in the Jerusalem as it is on this earth, that we would stand strong and testify to the truth of it, living holy lives as light and salt in this world. We pray for your strength and your blessing. For Jesus' sake, amen. <clears throat> well, let's conclude our time then by singing together. Actually, I don't... Oh, here we go. Psalm 67a. Psalm 67a. We'll stand and sing and then remain standing for the benediction. <clears throat> 